the butterfly lion. A miracle, a miracle. The lion eyed Bertie for a few moments. The yowling stopped, and he began to grunt and groan with pleasure as Bertie smoothed his mane and scratched him between the eyes. Remember me? he said to the lion. Remember Africa? You are the one? I am not dreaming this, said Monsieur Merlot. You are the boy in Africa? The one who tried to set him free? I've grown a bit, said Bertie, but it's me. Bertie and Monsieur Merlot shook hands warmly, while the lion turned his attention on me, licking my hand with his rough, warm tongue. I just gritted my teeth and hoped he wouldn't eat it. I did all I could, Monsieur Merlot said, shaking his head, but look at him. Look at him now, just skin and bones. Like me, all the animals, they are gone, except Le Prince Blanc. He's all I have left. I had to shoot my elephants, you know that. I had to. What else could I do? There was, there was no food to feed them. I could not let them starve, could I? Bertie sat down on the bed and put his arms around the lion's neck and buried his head in his mane. The lion rubbed up against him but he kept looking at me. I kept my distance, I can tell you. I just could not get it out of my head that lions do eat people, particularly if they are hungry lions. And this lion was very hungry indeed. You could see his ribs and his hip bones too. Don't worry, monsieur, said Bertie. I will find you food. I will find food enough for both of you. I promise. The driver of the ambulance I waved down thought at first that he was just giving a nurse a lift back to the village. He was, as you can imagine, a little more reluctant when he saw the old man, and then Bertie, and still more when he saw a huge white lion. The driver swallowed a lot, said nothing all the way, and just nodded when Bertie asked him to let us out in the village square. So there we were, half an hour or so later, the four of us sitting outside the cafe in the sun, the lion at our feet, gnawing a huge bone the butcher was only too pleased to sell us. Monsieur Merlot ate a plate of fried potatoes in complete silence and washed it down with a bottle of red wine. Around us gathered an astonished crowd of villagers, of French soldiers, of British soldiers, at a safe distance. All the while, Bertie scratched the lion's head right between his eyes. He always liked a good scratch, just there, Bertie said, smiling at me. I told you I would find him, didn't I? He went on. I was never sure you really believed me. Well, I did, I replied. And then I added, after a while anyway. It was the truth. I suppose that may explain why I took all that happened that morning so much in my stride. It was amazing, surreal almost, but it was no surprise. A prophecy come true, like a wish come true, and this was both, can never be entirely surprising. As we sat there outside the cafe, sipping our wine, the three of us decided what should be done about the White Prince. Monsieur Merlot kept crying and saying it was all a, a miracle, a miracle. And then he would wipe the tears from his eyes again and drink down another glass of wine. He liked his wine. The whole plan was entirely Bertie's idea. To be honest, I didn't see how it could possibly be done. I should have known better. I should have known that once Bertie had set his heart on something, he would see it through. As we walked the lion down the village street, Bertie leaning on the lion, me pushing Monsieur Merlot in the wheelchair. The crowd parted in front of us and backed away. Then they began to follow us, at a discreet distance, of course, up the road towards Bertie's hospital. Someone must have gone on ahead to warn them, because we could see now a huddle of doctors and nurses gathered on the front steps, and there were people peering out of every window. As we came up to the hospital, 
an officer stepped forward. A colonel it was. Bertie saluted. Sir, he began, Monsieur Mallow here is a very old friend of mine. We will need a bed in the hospital. He's in need of rest, sir, and a lot of good food. The same goes for the lion. So I wondered, sir, if you'd mind if we use the walled garden behind the hospital. There's a shed in there where the lion could sleep. He'd be quite safe, and so would we. I know him. He doesn't eat people. Monsieur Merlot here has said that if I can feed the lion and take care of him, then I can take him back to England with me. A brass cigarette, the colonel spluttered as he came down the steps. Who the devil do you think you are anyway, he said. And that was when he recognised Bertie. You're the fellow that won the VC, aren't you? He said, suddenly a lot more polite. Andrews, isn't it? Yes, sir. And I want to take the lion back to England when I go. We've got somewhere in mind for him to live. And he turned to me. Haven't we? He said. Yes, I said. It wasn't at all easy persuading the colonel to agree. He began to soften only when we told him that if we didn't look after the white lion, no one else would, and then he would have to be taken away and shot. A lion, the symbol of Britain, shot. Not at all good for morale, Bertie argued, and the colonel listened. It wasn't any easier persuading the powers that be in England to allow the lion to come back home when the war was over, but somehow Bertie managed it. He just wouldn't take no for an answer. Bertie always said afterwards that it was the medal that did it, that without the prestige of the Victoria Cross behind him, he never got away with it, and the White Prince would never have come home. When we docked at Dover, a band was playing and the bunting was out and there were photographers and newspaper reporters everywhere. The White Prince walked off the ship at Bertie's side to a hero's welcome. The British Lion comes home, roared the newspapers the next day. So we came back here to Strawbridge, Bertie, the White Prince, and me. I married Bertie in the village church. I remember that Bertie had a bit of a disagreement with the vicar because he wouldn't allow the lion inside the church for the wedding. I was very glad he didn't, but I never told Bertie that. Nanny Mason adored both Bertie and the White Prince, but she insisted on washing him often because he smelt the lion of Bertie. Nanny Mason stayed on with the three of us, her three children, she called us, until she retired to the seaside. In Deborah. The Butterfly Lion. We never had children of our own, just the White Prince. And I can tell you he was enough of a family for anyone. He roamed free in the park, just as we had planned he would, and chased the deer and the rabbits whenever he felt like it, but he never did learn how to kill for himself. You can't teach old lions new tricks. He lived well on venison mostly, and slept on a sofa on the landing. I wouldn't have him inside our bedroom, no matter how often Bertie asked. You have to draw the line somewhere. Bertie's leg never recovered completely. When it was bad, he often needed a stick, or me, or the lion to lean on. It pained him a lot, particularly when the weather was cold and damp, and he never slept well. On Sundays, the three of us would wander the park together, and he would sit at the top of Wood Hill with his arm around his old friend's neck, and I would fly kites. As you know, I've always loved kites. And so, it turned out, did the lion, who pounced on several of them as they landed, savaged them and ripped them to pieces. The lion never showed any interest in escaping. And even if he'd wanted to, the park wall was too high for an old lion to jump. Wherever Bertie went, he wanted to go too. And if ever Bertie went out in the car, then he'd sit by me near the stove in the kitchen and watch me with those great amber eyes, listening all the while for the sound of Bertie's car coming up the gravel to the front of the house. The old lion lived on to a ripe old age, but he became stiff in his legs and could see very little towards the end. He spent his last days 
stretched out asleep at Bertie's feet, right where you're sitting now. When he died, we buried him at the bottom of the hill up there. Bertie wanted it that way so he could always see the spot from the kitchen window. I suggested we planted a tree in case we forgot where he was. I'll never forget, he said fiercely. Never. And besides, he deserves a lot more than a tree. Bertie grieved on for weeks, months, after the lion died. There was nothing I could do to cheer him or even console him. He would sit for hours in his room or go off on long walks all on his own. He seemed so shut away inside himself, so distant. Try as I did, I, I could not reach him. Then one day I was in the kitchen here when I saw him hurrying down the hill, waving his stick and shouting for me. I've got it, he cried as he came in. I've got it at last. He showed me the end of his stick. It was white. See that, Millie? Chalk. It's chalk underneath, isn't it? So, I said, well, you know the famous white horse on the hillside at Uffington, the one they carved out of the chalk a thousand years ago? That horse never died, did it? It's still alive, isn't it? Well, that's what we're going to do. So he'll never be forgotten. We'll carve the white prince out on the hillside. He'll be there forever. And he'll be white forever, too. Well, it'll take a bit of time, won't it? I said. We've got plenty, haven't we? He replied with the same smile. He had smiled at me when he was a ten-year-old boy, asking me if he could come back and mend my kite for me. It took the next twenty years to do it. Every spare hour we had, we were up there, scraping away with spades and trowels, and we had buckets and wheelbarrows to carry away the turf and the earth. It was hard, back-breaking work, but it was a labour of love. We did it, Bertie and I. We did it together. Paws, claws, tail, mane, until he was whole and perfect in every detail. It was just after we'd finished that the butterflies first came. We noticed that when the sun comes out after the rain in the sun, the butterflies Adonis blues, they are, I look them up, come out to drink on the chalk face. Then the white prince becomes a butterfly lion and breathes again like a living creature. So, now you know how Bertie's white lion became the white prince and how the white prince became our butterfly lion. <laughs>